Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to SPEC CertiPrep's webinar, Certified Reference Material, Back to Basics. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Amy Williams, Marketing Manager for SPEC CertiPrep, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. Before we begin, I'd like to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. Everyone in attendance will receive an email with the presentation slides and links to the webinar recording on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the presentation, type them in the question box on your screen and we'll answer as many as we, as we can during our Q&A session following the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce Patricia Atkins, our presenter for today's webinar. Patricia is Product Application Specialist for Spec Prep and a regular from a number of past webinars and research products including our Trace Elements and Lipstick, the Chemistry of Wine, and BPA and Phthalates and Plastic Toys. Patricia? Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar today. I would introduce also uh, Gail Miller. She is our Quality Assurance Manager here at Spec Prep, and she's going to be addressing some of the finer points of accreditation and uncertainty. I'm going to start out. There's a lot of challenges that face analysts as well as CRM manufacturers that we both have in common. One of the biggest hurdles we all have is the whole accreditation regulation process. We're challenged to be compliant with whatever regulatory agencies that we deal with or are certified by. We're also asked to see uh, decreasing levels of, of compounds and increasing number of compounds. And many of us say, well, where do these accreditations come from and what do they mean to us? And where are all these definitions coming from? Like, what is a standard and why is it different from a certified reference material? Then there are some more challenges that we both have in common as analysts and CRM manufacturers. We want accurate analysis. So what are things like tradeability and uncertainty and error? And how are these each defined and measured? And of course, the bane of every analyst's existence is error. How do we reduce error in our analysis? And how do we eliminate things like contamination issues? And what practices or procedures do we have that actually increase our error in the lab? The first uh, thing we're going to take a look at is accreditations. Quite a few laboratories are ISO certified. Uh, so ISO 9001 is a family of, of quality management standards. It means that you have a quality management system in place that meets your customers' needs and meets whatever statutory or regulatory requirements of the products that you sell or the services that you provide. They're published by the International Organization for Standardization, and a third-party certification body will certify you for your uh, standing in ISO 9000. As of right now, there are over a million organizations worldwide that are certified under ISO. It has a, a very long history based in the military. Starting in the 1950s with the U.S. military, it was a procedural uh, procurement procedure. Then NATO decided to adapt a different series of standards, very similar, and that was then adapted to the British standard in 1979. Finally, the International Organization of Standards, which was founded in the 1940s, became ISO 9001 in 1987, with the latest edition being the 2008 edition of the ISO 9000 standards. When it comes to laboratories and reference materials, there are additional certifications and accreditations that you can have. In 1991, ISO drafted Guide 34, which was meant for the requirements for certified reference material producers. And it was then published in 1996 with the latest revision that we're working on now being the 2009 edition. In 1999, general laboratories and testing laboratories were covered under Guide 25. That later became 17025 in the year 2000 and was reissued again in 2005. If we look at, at ISO 17025, it's a laboratory quality management system, which means that you have a quality management, management system in place, and you have to demonstrate technical competency in your field. You also have to produce technically valid results. This guide allows the harmonization of standards and procedures so you comply to an international standard. This allows labs with equivalent certifications to be able to share results among one another. 
And this would even pass borders. So because there is an international standard, our, a lab that is 17025 in the U.S. can share results with a lab that's also 17025 in Europe or Japan or China. ISO Guide 34 is specifically for CRM producers. This allows a CRM producer to transfer their results to other labs, meaning that this material can be used for calibration of measuring equipment or the evaluation or validation of your procedures. There are requirements for a CRM manufacturer. We must demonstrate scientific and technical competency and the ability to supply supplemental information about our materials. And that usually comes in the form of a certificate of analysis. Here at SPECS, we actually are accredited to all three. We are accredited to ISO 9001 for our general quality management system. And this includes requirements for our quality manual, our customers, how to deal with customer satisfaction, um, internal audits. We carry 17025 because we have to test our certified reference materials once we manufacture them. Guide 34 gives manufacturing uh, requirements for us on how we manufacture our CRMs. And then they're intertwined with 17025 because those are the requirements we need to test our certified reference materials. Now if we're going to look at kind of the alphabet soup of, of terminology, we'll start with the the first question, what is a standard? The simplest answer for what a standard is, it's a known compared to an unknown. Or it's an acknowledged measure of comparison for a quantitative or qualitative value. ISO has a different way of looking at standards. They designate a primary and a secondary standard. A primary standard to ISO is the highest metrological quality, and its value is accepted without a reference to a similar or same quality standard. Now, the classic example in years past has been the Grand K or the Grand Kilogram, which was the uh, primary standard of the kilogram that was housed in the International Bureau of Weights and Measures outside of Paris. Then you also have secondary standards, where a value is assigned by comparison with the same quality and quantity of a primary standard. There's a National Measurement Institute for each country. And that falls under the primary standards. In the United States, it is NIST. In Canada, it's NRC. And in the United Kingdom, it's NPL. This is where your NIST standards would fall. Your secondary standards that would be related to the primary standards is where your CRMs would fall. So there are quite a few roles for standards. The one that we're uh, most familiar with as an analyst are quantitation. So you would use your uh, standards in a lab as an external standard or an internal standard, or you might even use it for standard addition. But standards can also be used to find, calculate, and correct for uncertainty in your process. Things like the calibration of your instrument, um, the instrument uncertainty, the calculation of recoveries. They also can be used to find and eliminate error in your process. By running standards throughout your process, you're able to monitor the process and identify any potential sources of error. So what's a reference material? A reference material is a material or substance whose property values are sufficiently homogeneous and well established. And they're used for calibration of an apparatus, assessment of a measured method, or to assign values to materials. So what are certified reference materials? The simple definition is a reference material that accompanies, is accompanied by a certificate. This certificate needs to have certain necessary information according to the ISO guidelines. Some of the, these property values include traceability and uncertainty. But it also must contain a large amount of supplementary information, including certified bodies, method, methods of measurements, the way the material is prepared, and any statistical treatment of the results that are given. Our certificates contain information on uncertainty, traceability, and how to use this standard as a calibration standard. Um, we also contain supplemental information, which includes how to, how to store the CRM and, and its intended use. There's also information on the level of homogeneity for a particular lot of standard. We include also calculate the calculations that are used to calculate the uncertainty for a particular CRM. Now that we've given you a bunch of other terms, well, let's go through and try to define a few of these.
traceability. That's the ability of a company to trace their product from raw material origin through the manufacturing process and finally to the delivery and the receipt. In addition, for CRMs, that ensures that our product can be traced back to a primary standard. Stability means that during normal use, this product would not be reactive. It would retain, retain its properties in the expected time scale in the presence of whatever normal conditions are for that particular application. So if you received a standard and it said a six month expiration date and it had to be kept in the refrigerator in order to be stable, as long as you follow those conditions, then that, there's a reasonable expectation that that standard would last you your six months and would not change its uh, composition or properties. Unstable material would corrode, decompose, polymerize, burn, explode under what would be considered normal conditions. Now homogeneity, there are uh, two different ways of determining homogeneity. There is homogeneity that is in bottle. This checks for product stratification or precipitation. Now this should not be confused if you receive a standard and you see that the, the, during the transition that the sample has basically settled out. If there are instructions about how the material can be dissolved back in solution, then once those instructions are followed, the material should then be considered to be homogeneous. Then there is between bottle homogeneity. This is when a manufacturer would make a large lot of material and it is bottled into separate units. Those units are then considered to be an entire lot and a subset of anywhere between five and ten of the bottles uh, would be sampled to check for homogeneity. So what are error and uncertainty? Error is the difference between your measurement and the true value of what you're trying to measure or the measurement. This does not include mistakes. If mistakes are made, they should be explained and documented and excluded from the data set. So a mistake does not become a data point within your data set. Error causes values to differ when the measurement is repeated over and over again. And when you have this data set and you see error, there is no one result that looks preferable over another. It's impossible to completely characterize errors, but they can be uh, controlled. Uncertainty, on the other hand, is an estimate attached to a certified value which characterizes the range of values where your actual true value lies within a certain stated level of confidence. This can show random effects, short-term fluctuations in temperature and humidity, static electricity, and air pressure. It also can account for variability in the performance of an analyst. And finally, it can correct for uh, drift with correction factor. The difference between error versus uncertainty Error usually can't be estimated, but uncertainly can be estimated. If we look at a manufacturing event for a certified reference material, there are certain steps involved in producing that material. It would start out with you having a starting material and making that initial dilution. And these are all the uncertainty possibilities among uh, that first manufacturing step. You have your starting material purity. That would come with a certificate and a certain purity level. It may or may not have a confidence level. Then you have your balance with its weight and its certification for its accuracy. Your solvent purity as well would have a certificate. And then you have your volumetric flask where your tolerance, your temperature uh, would be certain variables. If you make a second dilution, you add another layer of uncertainty. This includes potential tolerance of your syringe or pipette or different temperature variations. So to determine your uncertainty, you determine what you wish to first measure. You outline the process which you're conducting this measurement. You identify all your sources of uncertainty. You estimate the uncertainty from each source. And finally, you combine and expand all your uncertainty. Once you determine your sources of uncertainty, now you have to decide what type of uncertainty it is. A type A uncertainty is associated with a number of measurements or a standard deviation of a mean. Type B uncertainties are based on scientific judgment and experience, and there are three common models of uncertainty, rectangular, 
triangular, and normal. Under right, rectangular distribution, if you want to calculate the standard uncertainty from a listed uncertainty that that is on your certificate, you would take the normal you would you would take the listed uncertainty and divide it by a normalizing factor of the square root of three. This type of of rectangular distribution is for certificates that do not give you a confidence limit with their uncertainty. They're only stating their uncertainty, such as 100 milligrams per liter plus or minus 0.01. Your second type, uh, type B uncertainty, is your triangular distribution. This would be used for things like glassware or pipettes, where there's a stated range on your pipette that might say 10 mils plus or minus 0.01 mils. This type of uncertainty, you would normalize this type of uncertainty by using the listed uncertainty and divided by the square root of 6. The third type B uncertainty is your normal distribution. This is where your certificate would actually give you a confidence limit with your uncertainty. And in order to normalize that, you would actually, with a 95% confidence limit, you would have a coverage factor of 2, which is your K factor. You would take your listed uncertainty and divide it by the K factor to normalize your uncertainty. Once you've normalized your uncertainty, then you would take each of your processes and using the following model, you would actually calculate an interim uncertainty. After you take all of your processes and determine your interim uncertainty, you would then combine them using the formula below to combine all of your uncertainties to get a total uncertainty. From that uncertainty, we had a coverage factor. This is your expanded uncertainty. The coverage factor is determined by your confidence limit. For our CRMs, we're using a 95% confidence limit, and therefore your coverage factor would be equal to 2. Now we're going to go through some of the uh, analysis challenge and issues that you might face in the lab when it comes to error, cleanliness, and a bunch of uh, different challenges. The biggest challenge, I think, is that our analytical threshold keeps decreasing. Our modern instrumentation's level of detection has uh, been dramatically reduced to the PPV or PPP ranges. And of course, lower detection limits means greater importance of eliminating trace contaminations. And you want to eliminate these trace impurities in reference materials, in your samples, in your reagent, and, and definitely in your lab environment. So how, just how much is a part per billion or part per trillion? If you're a, a maker of martinis, a, a part per million is a drop of vermouth in, a barrel, in half a barrel of gin or a part per billion is one drop of vermouth in 500 barrels of gin. A part per trillion is one drop of vermouth in 500,000 barrels of gin. Another challenge is the list of compounds that are being regulated keeps increasing. An example of this are drinking water standards in the U.S. In 1914, the first drinking water standards were introduced, and they were mostly bacteriological standards. 1962 saw the chemical standards instituted. There were 28 substances, and two of those were organic compounds. And then since 1974, there has been a threefold increase in compounds and a de decrease in detection limits. This is uh, from a handout from the EPA celebrating 25 years of safe drinking water. And this shows that when the regulations started, a very small amount of compounds were being regulated. And over the years, those number of compounds have greatly increased. So where are our potential sources for contamination or error? They're everywhere in our lab. From our chemical components, including our solvents, our reagents, our additives, our raw materials, to our laboratory components, syringes, pipettes, glassware, and et cetera. The way you prepare your samples can add contamination and error. Out or your serial dilutions can also add contamination and error. And finally, our instrumentation, whatever is involved in our instrumentation, be it columns, mobile faces, gases, carriers. Other uh, sources of error which might not be as obvious is our laboratory environment. Our lab surfaces would contain uh, residue and dust, 
Ventilation in hoods can circulate or poorly circulate air through a laboratory system allowing contamination. And the location and, and the cleanliness of the waste containers can also lead to error or contamination. And finally, the lab personnel. The cosmetics they use, the type of gloves they use, different lab hygiene practices, or even human error can lead to contamination issues. If we look at the chemical components first, especially your starting materials, this is the base of if you're making a standard or if you're making a dilution or you're just creating a, a solution or a process. If this has uh, trace impurities, those trace impurities can cause overlapping spectra if you're doing MS, incorrect calibration curves, or just inaccurate results. There are some very common laboratory contaminations. Some of the metals are calcium and aluminum. We have phthalates. We have different impurities that are associated with each particular compound. We also have volatile organics like chloroform and acetone in the lab, as well as persistent laboratory solvents. If we look at those solvents, they can be a source of contamination in the lab, meaning they're persistent solvents in the lab. Something like a DCM or a carbon disulfide can be seen in uh, laboratory results for many, many days or many runs afterwards. You also have contamination within your solvents. You would have particulates, gas, preservatives, different additives. There might be compounds being leached or dissolved from their containers. Uh, glass containers can have boron or, or sodium or the plastic liners of the caps can have phthalates. Here's a chart of, of different grades of solvent. Most of these are used in organic processes. But you can see that they have different analytical limits. Something like an LCMS grade of solvent is shown to have low ionic impurities of under 0.1 ppm. But something that's maybe a reagent grade can only assure about 95% purity. So if you're using the wrong grade of solvent for the application that you're trying to, to work with, you could be adding uh, amounts of contamination or error to your work that wouldn't have been there if you used the appropriate grade of solvent. Likewise with acids. If you're using an analytical process, you really need to use high purity acids. So if you're doing ICPMS, uh, high purity acid would be a must. You would use this for your dissolution of your materials, digestions, and dilution. If even a small amount of contamination is found in an acid, it actually could cause a, a lot of, of contamination to your final product. Here's an, an example. If you had an alcohol of 5 mL of an acid, and that acid had 100 ppb of nickel as contaminant, and you used it to dilute a sample to 100 mL, in essence, you'd be introducing 5 ppb of nickel into your sample. So when possible, use high purity acids, but they can be kind of expensive. Another major component of organic and inorganic analyses is water. It's used in aqueous standards, it's used in LC and LCMS mobile phases, and the quality and accuracy of your analysis sometimes will depend on your water quality. Um, many labs use ASTM type water. Well, ASTM has, designates four types of water, type 1 through type 4, and type 3 and type 4 are not really good for analytical use. Type 4 is not really good for lab use at all because it has high amounts of sodium, silica, total organic carbon. If you're doing critical applications, you're going to look for type 1 or type 2 ASTM water. Type 1 is actually better, and, if you can, and the better you can get it, the, the less contaminants you'll have. Type 1 water has a limit of 50 micrograms per liter max of to total organic carbon. If we look at some of the organics of laboratory water, we did a small study on different types of laboratory water sources, and we were looking to see what kind of phthalates we would find in it. We took some HPLC bottled water, as well as some LCMS bottled water, and we compared that to our DI water that we produce in-house. And we looked at it in two different ways, a system that had been stationary or static like overnight, and a system that was allowed to flush for you know, several minutes to half an hour before we actually took the sample. And then we also compared it to a carboy, carboy of uh, bottled water and municipal tap water. And surprisingly, what we thought would be very clean water, because it, it was for an organic process, HPLC water had almost uh, 91 ppb of phthalates. The LCMS water, or the stationary, I'm sorry, the flushed DI water had very little amounts of, of phthalates, under 10 
So ways to reduce contamination in air from laboratory water. I had not realized until I started looking into it, but bottled water actually has an expiration date. It is like any other reagent or solvent in your lab, and there is an expiration date on it. And water quality can change. Your storage bottles, what you store your water in, or what the water comes stored in, can lead to contaminants. There's also the possibility of microbial growth. If water is exposed to any potential microbes, they will take up residence in your water, and it can cause growth, which would then contaminate your instrument or um, cause error and contamination in your samples. It's suggested if you use water in your processes that the water should be changed once a day. If you have an HPLC system and you're running a system where the final conditions of the day are 80% or more water, that the system then should be flushed before the end of the day. You can also use for an HPLC or an HPLC-MS, you can use an aggressive mix of solvents to flush your system to basically kill off any microbial growth in your system. And this would be things like acetone, IPA, cyclohexane. Then we will look at our, some of our chemical stock contamination. A lot of the packaging that comes from raw material manufacturers have the potentially, potential to be contaminated. Uh, glass containers would give you sodium and boron, but you'd also have plastic caps, seals, or septa that have phthalates. There also can be manufacturing contamination. And it's very difficult to eliminate contamination from these samples that you get from the manufacturer, so often you need to test them before you use them. And when possible, you can clean them, you can rinse them, you can bake them. We did a small study on some uh, sodium sulfate and some sodium chloride that we had taken from our laboratory. And after rinsing it with a solvent for the first time, our sodium chloride had 1,400 uh, ppb of phthalates. After our second rinse, it was just a little less at 1,200 ppb of, of phthalates. After we baked it in an oven, in a kneeling oven, we were able to get the phthalate content down to non-existent. Well, our laboratory equipment is actually the most common source of uncertainty and contamination in our lab. Things like our syringes, our pipettes, our laboratory glassware and storage containers can have issues of cleanliness, accuracy, carryover, uh, different calibration and maintenance issues. So how clean are your pipettes? We did a small study where we took pipettes and we ran 2% nitric acid through 5 mil pipettes that were cleaned manually. So these pipettes were actually cleaned by an analyst and they were believed to be good for use. So 2% nitric acid was filled in these pipettes and then we took that and we analyzed it by ICPMS. And you can see there was quite a bit of carryover, metal carryover. We had 18 ppb of calcium, 5 ppb of lead, almost 20 ppb of sodium. Now, if you're organic and you use syringes, how clean are your syringes? Most manufacturers suggest you rinse to waste between two and three times the, the volume of the syringe, and maybe between five and 20 times overall. So we wanted to see uh, how effective this cleaning regime was. So we took some different size syringes, and we filled them with a deuterated mix of some common compounds, in this case, naphthalene, phenanthrene, chrysine. For a 1,000 microliter syringe, that very first wash contained 16 ppm of naphthalene and 24 ppm of chrysine. By the second and third wash, our ppm levels had dropped considerably. And by about the fifth wash, we were having about 0% carryover. When we went to a slightly smaller syringe, a 100 microliter syringe, you can see the carryover effect was a little higher. Our first wash carried 25 ppm of naphthalene and up to 65 ppm of chrysine. And it took over five washes to basically get all of the carryover removed from that syringe. The problem came with our 10 microliter syringe. This very small syringe in our very first wash for chrysine had almost 20% carryover, or 360 ppm. And it was many washes, over 10 washes, uh, or 15 washes, to get that level to drop below 1 ppm. So if you're using a 10 microliter syringe to do dilutions or to transfer samples, it could take up to 15 washes or more in order to get your levels of your previous compounds below uh, 1 ppm. And these were 1,000 microgram per uh, mil solutions, so 1,000 ppm solutions to start with. And if you're using a pure sample, then your carryover could actually be much higher. So smaller volume syringes need more rinses. 
If you're using a 10 microliter syringe, at least 5 to 10 of those rinses should go to waste and another 5 to 10 rinches to clean that syringe. If it's a viscous sample or more concentrated sample, it's going to need more cleaning. And you could pull your syringe through a vacuum system and take the syringe fully apart in order to thoroughly clean it. There was also some tips from some syringe manufacturers that say if you're using one of the heated devices to clean your syringe, don't use a, a fixed needle syringe in one of those heated devices that are heated to above 60 C. They also suggest you don't submerge your syringes in solvents to clean them, and you should just take them apart and clean the plunger and air dry them before putting them back together. Now, reducing syringe error is an, another concept. We decided to see how accurate a measurement we could make using different sized syringes and different volumes we were trying to measure. Something like the 10 microliter syringe, when we dispensed 2 microliters, we found we had 23% error. Something around the range of a 100 microliter syringe, we had dispensing 10 microliters about 6% error. Now, as you go to uh, a larger amount actually dispensed, so a 25 microliter to dispense 25 microliters, you have about a 1% error. So you should really be using calibrated syringes with appropriate range for the level you're decanting. So if you have a 1,000 or 100 microliter syringe, no lower than 20% of that syringe's volume if you're looking for a 1% error in, in your dispensing. For a smaller uh, volume syringe, you're going to have to go more than 20% of that syringe volume in order to decrease your error to under 1%. So how clean are your storage containers? You have different size bottles, shapes, different materials, construction, and a lot of the materials that these bottles are created from can pose some issues with contamination in the lab. Glass bottles, for instance, might have active sites where your analytes can bind to them. This is a, a chart of some of the common major metal impurities in different types of bottling materials. Something like a polycarbonate bottle have things like chloride, bromide, and aluminum, whereas something like a polystyrene bottle might have sodium, titanium, and aluminum. For a glass a uh, borosilicate glass bottle, of course, would have sodium and boron and silica. So how clean is your laboratory? Take a look at your walls, your ceilings, your floors. Are they sealed and free of dust? Any sources of areas where dust can collect or contamination can, can build up, that's a place where a uh, potential error and contamination can find its way into your sample. Some labs have HEPA filters mounted in the ceiling in order to circulate and purify their air. And if you're working in an acidic environment or an environment that has a lot of solvents or acids, there should not be any exposed metal parts that can be uh, subject to corrosion. Contamination sources can include the type of ceiling tiles that you have, the paint on the wall, cement, the drywall, any dust or rust on shelving, equipment, and furniture and your temperature control system. Your actual heating and cooling systems can move dust and contaminants from one lab to another. We did a study where we pre uh, prepared a solution in a clean room, and then we took that solution and, and divided it into two, and we brought the one into our regular lab, and then we left the other one in the clean room to be packaged. When the same solution was packaged in two different types of environments, we saw a very large difference in certain metals. Something like iron, in a regular lab, we were seeing 7 ppb of iron, but in the clean lab, it was less than 1 ppb of iron. Something like zinc, we were seeing in the regular lab about 8 ppb, where in the clean lab, again, under 1 ppb. So how do we control our laboratory environment to avoid contamination? You minimize exposure. You cover your samples, your equipment whenever possible. You use a glove lock box or a quick clean room. You clean your work surfaces. You can clean it with reagent grade water. You can wear powder-free gloves because powder may contain zinc. But you also have sweat from uh, our lab analysts, which can contain potassium and lead, calcium, and a bunch of other different ions. You can also use metal-free containers when possible, volumetric glass and beakers uh, made out of polycarbonate or glass. If you don't have a clean room, you can actually have a clean bench or a clean glove box with a positive flow of air or nitrogen. 
You can use adhesive mats at the entry points to control dust and dirt. Or you can wear shoe coverings when entering or leaving the lab. When it comes to laboratory personnel, they might unwittingly be, bring contamination or error into the lab with them. Things like jewelry, cosmetic, and lotions can contribute fragrances, solvents, uh, phthalates, metals like aluminum, lead, tin. Hair dyes can contribute lead acetate. If an analyst is using calamine lotion, they can be contributing zinc oxide. Dandruff shampoo has selenium in it. And jewelry can obviously contribute metals to an analysis if you're concerned about metals analysis. In your organics lab, jewelry can react very violently with different organic solvents and cause burns. And then you have the issue of lab coats. A lot of analysts get very attached to their lab coats, but unwittingly, by not uh, throwing that lab coat into the recycle bin to, to be cleaned regularly, they're contributing phthalates, solvent residue, dust, uh, calcium, sodium, potassium. And if they smoke, things like volatile organics or cadmium or semi-volatile organics can cling to their clothing or their lab coat and also can, can contaminate an analysis. So, our final tips. How do you determine if you have a clean lab? You run blanks and standards. And your blanks have to be clean. You can't have any false positive or false negative results. And you should carry these blanks and standards through all steps of your analytical procedure to, to monitor and correct for any, any error or uncertainties that you have. If you want to see more, we have a, a, a lot of information on our website about our white papers, our webinar recordings, including a, a recording on the statistics of uncertainty, our statistics webinar, which would have a lot more information about statistics, as well as some articles about lab cleanliness we publish in Tech Philosophy. Thank you very much, Patricia and Gail. We have some time for a few questions, and we've gotten some good ones. So uh, the first question I'm going to ask is for Patricia. If there is contamination in manually cleaned pipettes, how do you truly get them free of contamination? Well, obviously, the more you clean a pipette, you're going to, to take off some contamination. Here at Specs, we use a pipette cleaner, which is an automated system where we rinse uh, um, solvent, in this case, uh, water through our pipettes at, at a higher pressure, and they're rinsed over and over again for a period of time, and then they're allowed to air dry. That actually reduces the amount of contamination in our pipettes to almost non-measurable levels. Thank you, Patricia. Um, the next question is for Gail. If you are a reference material producer, are there requirements for the contents of your certificates? Yes, they are. Under Guide 34, there, they reference Guide 31, which has all the requirements for what needs to be in the certificates of analysis. So yes, we do conform to all of those requirements under Guide 31. Um, they include things like listed uncertainty, homogeneity, stability calculation, storage requirements, um, and your guarantee of your expiration and a date of certification. Okay, thank you, Gail. Um, Patricia, if you are consistently seeing a ca carryover from high concentration standards, is there a way to stop that carryover? Absolutely. You can actually uh, segregate your glassware or your pipettes or your syringes. What we tend to do when we use high concentration standards, when we uh, dilute them down or we have high concentration samples, we have a set of glassware that is meant for higher concentration work or for specific metals or specific compounds. So that set of glassware and measuring apparatus is, is left for those specific uh, instances when we need it. And then the other glassware is for lower level work. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question for Gail. Does the stability and homogeneity play a part in the final uncertainty calculation? Yes. Um, once, you've once you've established all your processes to the manufacturer of a CRM, that uncertainty is called your uncertainty of characterizations. What then gets added to your uncertainty is your overall uncertainty, is your uncertainty due to the homogeneity we have and the stability component. There are two stability components. One is a long-term stability component or a storage component, and the other is a short-term stability component, which usually has to deal with transportation to different areas of the country. Okay. And another for Patricia, does SPECS guarantee the shelf life, the expiration date of a standard 
in the original container once the original container is opened, but still um, shared according to Specs' instructions? That's, a, that's kind of a hard question to answer. The answer is both, both yes and no. If you treat your standard uh, within the conditions that Specs outlines on its certificate, under normal conditions with no addition of error on your part, it should be good for the life of that standard. Uh, the caveat is we don't know what you do to that standard. So you might have introduced a contaminant into the standard that then contaminates the standard. An example would be you're opening up a standard and you're using a syringe or pipette that has not been cleaned properly. In that case, um, it would not be covered because you're introducing an error. Whatever is in the container or bottle itself, as long as it is treated within the specifications of how we say to, to handle your sample or your standard, then yes, that is covered. But we do not cover any error that is introduced into your sample. So it's kind of about both a yes and a no. Okay, thank you. Thank you again to Patricia and Gail. We're going to wrap up today's presentation. I'd like to thank you all for attending, and uh, we very much appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back at future webinars. Have a great day.